Hey everybody, this is Steve with Keep Em Rollin', and for today's episode, I want to show, I guess, a recent find and kind of give a lesson here that will hopefully help all of you out on your collecting quests. Um, I don't know why I enunciated that so much, collecting quests. Uh, regardless, yesterday, Sunday, I went to a vintage book and paper show, lots of postcards, books, etc. The military stuff, incredibly overpriced. I mean, ridiculously overpriced. Things like a single ration book for $30. I mean, that's just, just ludicrous. But after the show, uh, there was a large antique mall a few miles away from the show, so I went to the antique mall, and just an absolutely gorgeous mall. I mean, it, it was truly gorgeous. But once again, the price on things were absolutely just out of sight. I guess it's because it's near a major city. Maybe people have more money to spend there or what have you. While there, I found this, a U.S. mess kit. And I vowed I would never buy another mess kit. Um, the, I have several, enough uh, for representation in my collection, enough for use. But this one right here, it just, it just drew me right in just because it is in absolutely just beautiful, beautiful shape. You can see it's a U.S. M.A. Company, 1944. And they wanted $38, I think was the price, if I remember, 38 or 35 I can't remember, which is a lot to pay for a mess kit. And sorry about the hands, I've been doing some housework today, which uh, involves painting, so a little bit of paint there. But, uh, you know, normally... For $38, I would simply walk on by and just laugh. Um, mess kits, you know, I had a friend who had a box of mess kits that he couldn't give away. Granted, they were dinged up and a little rusty, but he just couldn't give them away. However, I always look at something, and when I picked it up, as you can hear, there was stuff inside of it. So I thought, oh, well, it has the silverware. Let's just look at this and just see what we have. So upon opening it, here... You can see the inside is absolutely, uh, it's once again, just absolutely beautiful. But inside, you can see we have a hodgepodge of stuff. And you have your standard mess kit spoon here. And it's got the correct, I don't know if we can zoom in on that. I think it's upside down. But uh, it's got the correct maker for 1945. Uh, we have a nice mess kit knife here. It's also got the correct stamp on it to put it at war time. We have the nice fork here, also stamped with the correct stamp to put it into the World War II range. Sometimes the silverware was dated, sometimes you just have to look at the company that manufactured it to see if it's the wartime silverware or post-war. So all these are wartime. So I thought, okay, $38 mint condition kit plus the silverware, it's becoming a little bit more reasonable. Not much, but a little bit more. And then there was an extra knife thrown in here. This one's actually a World War I knife that someone had kind of uh, ground down to make it as more of a tool, if you will, versus a mess kit knife. This was pretty common practice as these are very heavy duty. Um, this one's dated 1917. So I'm like, all right, bang, gets a little better. But what really intrigued me were these right here. In the bottom of this mess kit were these four items. And for those of you who may not know, these right here were affectionately known by the soldiers and are still known today as the P-38 can opener. Soldiers and civilians, uh, even in the prepper community, swear by this little gadget. They state that it can do everything from uh, opening cans to uh, cutting through packages to uh, being used as a screwdriver if need be and so forth and so on. So just a fantastic little tool. Now, I'd heard about these. I had seen these before, but I've never added one to my collection. And as I stood there looking at them, I thought, what in the world have I been thinking? Something that is such a huge part of the World War II GIs and sailors and Marines kit, and I've never even looked at adding one. Now, one of those reasons is because these started production during World War II, 1942, and they were produced all the way up, I want to say, into the 70s, 80s. I couldn't find the exact cutoff date for them. If someone else knows, feel free to post. But the pattern, however, was sold, and they're reproduced. So you can really go into any surplus shop, sporting goods store, flea market, eBay, whatever, and you can find these. And 
the prices are all over the place. I mean, you can find a box of 500 for, you know, $40, $50. You can find some selling for $2, $3 each. So I wanted to know a little bit more about what made a P-38 truly a wartime P-38, World War II, or post-war Korea, Vietnam, or civilian market. And these, they just, they just called on me. And one of them is stamped with a name. And before I bought the mess kit, I looked up the name and realized that the name uh, was of a company that manufactured these only during World War II. So it was a true wartime P-38. And I thought, well, if one of them's a wartime P-38, the rest may be so it justifies the purchase. So I went up and uh, asked if they would do any better. They had the standard 10% discount, so I took that and I think I paid $35 in the end with tax for the mess kit with all the silverware and the P-38s. Now, I came home and began to do research. Love digging into the history of items. And sometimes the research goes real well and sometimes the research goes absolutely horrible. This was a mixture of both. But in the end, I came up with a pretty good idea. So let's go down a little bit of the history of the P-38s. The P-38, the official name is the U.S. Army Pocket Can Opener, or if you want to be real official, it is the opener, comma, can, comma, hand, comma, folding type, comma, one. The name P-38 is a nickname given to this because reportedly it takes 38 punches with the little can opener blade here. So let me get this open. There you go. So it opens up. It takes 38 punches in a can to get the can lid off. So P-38 was kind of the nickname. Now, I learned that another nickname for them was the John Wayne, because John Wayne, in a Marine Corps Navy training film, he used a P-38 to open a can. And so in the Army, they were no more as the P-38. In the Navy and Marine Corps, they were no more by the nickname of the John Wayne. So I thought that was kind of interesting. All of this is subjective, by the way. Don't take this as hardcore fact. Um, this is what just kept being repeated, and I tried to verify things, and there's nothing written down to say this is 100% why, but there was enough kind of uh, ancillary evidence to indicate that that's the reason why, okay? Now, these were developed in just 30 days in the summer of 1942 by the Subsistence Research Laboratory of Chicago. They needed a way that when they shipped out sea rations, you could open the cans very easily without having to ship out a bulky can opener and so forth and so on. So the idea was in a sea ration box, they would include a dozen of these little P-38s. These were not issued to the GI. That's one misconception is the GIs were given this as part of their equipment and that's why they had them. No, they were just simply included in the sea ration boxes. The GIs themselves realized how handy they were and how indestructible they were, so they began to hoard them. They would take them, put them on their dog tag chains, um, you know, put them in their pocket. They were just that handy little tool just in case. And in fact, there were some side stories I came across where uh, sea rations would make their way to the front lines, and when the GIs would open the sea rations, they would see that they've already been tampered with, and the one thing that would be missing would be the... P-38s. Somebody back further on the food chain, if you will, uh, decided to open the box, take out the P-38s to trade, sell, what have you, and then ship the box on to the front lines where they had no can openers. This is one other reason why these were an invaluable little tool. It's very difficult to open a can without a can opener. It's a messy endeavor. Believe me, I've tried. Now, with these little can openers, as I said, trade uh, that was a popular thing. If you had two or three of them and someone didn't have one, you could you could trade for something else um, or, uh, you know, maybe charge somebody for it. But it just became that staple. So, fascinating information. But how do you tell the difference between the World War II P-38s and the modern P-38s? And this was where I was hung up. I had no idea where to go as far as what is modern and what is old. Uh, as I said Earlier P-38s are everywhere. Uh, you can purchase them at surplus shops. You can purchase them at the, the uh, sporting goods stores. You can purchase them at the flea market. You can purchase them on eBay. Uh, they're as cheap as 50 cents. Okay, so what made the World War II ones? Well, what I learned is that the World War II ones are becoming very, very difficult to find simply because they've been worn out. You know, there were, sh I wouldn't say millions, but there were lots of these produced during the war. However, a lot of them have disappeared. So, 
What I learned in my research is as follows. Now take this with a grain of salt. I am not an expert on the P-38s. I don't claim to be an expert on the P-38s. So bear with me, this is just some very cursory information that may help you when you are looking for a wartime P-38. You happen to be at the flea market, you happen to be at a military show, whatever, and you see one of these. What I'm gonna tell you will hopefully give you the uh, ammunition, if you will, to make a snap decision on whether that's a wartime P-38 or not. So, what I learned, there were three manufacturers during World War II. One was called Bloomfield, one was called Androck, spelled A-N-D-R-O-C-K, and one was called J.W. Speaker. Okay? The Bloomfields were completely blank. They did not have the company name. They did not have U.S. They had no date. They were just a blank P-38. The Androck were stamped U.S. and then the company name Androck, A-N-D-R-O-C-K, which is a little misleading because when you look at it, it looks like it says U.S. and Rock, but it's actually U.S. and Rock. The third, J.W. Speaker, stamped theirs, Speaker, USA, 4344. So it did have a wartime date on them. Now, in all the digging I've been able to do, those are the three, and that's how they are stamped. Okay, so that kind of gives you at least a start as far as determining if they're wartime or not. But I learned there were two other tells. Okay, there are actually three. One I'm a little confused on because on uh, uh, the third tell, it said that the tip of the blade was actually something that you could sharpen. It, was, it wasn't it was stamped and they went into a little bit of detail. However, in looking at the one that I have that is a true wartime one, I could not delineate between what they were talking about. So we're just going to leave that off for confusion's sake right now. But the two things that they kept repeating over and over to determine what is wartime and what is not is number one, the little blade here. See the little blade there? They said that on the wartime ones, the blade had no lock. So you can see how that blade just flips open and closed. Nothing is keeping it in place. All of these do that, okay? Now you could argue that it's possible they wore out, and there is evidence that sometimes that little snap that will keep the blade closed does wear out and you end up with one that uh, you might think is wartime, but there's one other tell, and this is the most crucial, and that is what they call the rib. The rib is that metal line there that runs from the left to the right. You can see it right where my thumb is, that, that ridge that runs all the way across. On the wartime models, we're going to set this down so you can see it better. I'm going to, I'll use the knife here to point. On the wartime models, that rib runs from left all the way to the right. And when you look at all of these, you can see that rib runs all the way across. It does not, where's the other one? Oh, it's about here. All the way across. Let me flip open that blade so you can, once again, get a better idea. And this was something that they repeated over and over, that that rib runs all the way across. And from all the research I've been able to do, that was the most obvious tell, unless you find one that's the speaker with the 4243, which is pretty obvious, that that is the tell to determine if it is a wartime P-38 or a post-war P-38. Now, I happen to have in my possession, a post-war P-38. I'm going to show you that in just a moment, but I want to find the one here that has the stamping on it so you can at least see... I think it's this one here. It's, yeah, we'll see if we can... Whoops. It's very... It's... You can... There, there we go. You can see how it says U.S. and Rock right across there. So, uh, that's something to look for, okay? The rest... As you look here, you can see there's absolutely no stamping. So, it is my opinion, before I show you one of the, the post-war ones, it is my opinion that what I have here is I have one Androck, that's obvious uh, because of the, the stamping on it, and then I have three, sorry I drifted there, three Bloomfields, which are the unmarked ones. So, I have in my possession four wartime P-38s, which is 
absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Now, I said I want to show you one here. Let's let's pull one of these out. I'm going to slide this away because I have one that's on my keys, and this is going to bring me to a very important uh, thing I'm going to tell you in just a moment. So, all right, let's spin this around here. I have I have my dad's dog tag on here. Okay, you can see that this is a U.S. speaker. Okay, so right away I said earlier that speaker was a wartime producer, but there's no date. So this is a post-war speaker, or, well, post-war speaker, post-war P-38 made by speaker, okay? Now, as for the tell, let's, let's bring this one up here, and you can see the rib from end to end versus the rib that doesn't extend all the way to the end. I hope you guys can see that, and gals. Rib goes from end to end. Rib does not go. In fact, you can, sorry, I could try and get it without the shadow there. You can see it does not go end to end. It's rounded off and does not meet the end of the can opener. Now, we talked about that locking blade. Once again, this one just flips. This one here, if you listen, it will kind of do it. It's a little worn out, but hear that? There's just a little bit of a click, and that helps keep this blade closed. Okay? So, this is the tutorial on the P38s. And I wanted to do this because, you know, I have a couple other episodes already in the can for you guys and gals. I wanted to uh, share with you one about the reenactment I went to in that. But doing this, I thought, you know, this is something that I think every collector who collects U.S. should have in their collection. I mean, it was such a common tool that the GIs used. It was such an important tool. And how cool is that to have that in your collection? But I thought, you know, if I can give you guys, once again, the ammunition to be able to look at one and determine whether it's World War II or post-war. And another reason is because the wartime ones, they're becoming expensive. You look online, and if you can find a true wartime P-38, they're running sometimes between $15 and $20 each for a true wartime P-38. And you want to make sure that if you're going to spend $20 on one of these, which, you know, if I could verify it's a true World War II, $20 I don't think is a bad deal to have it in my collection. You only need one, as an example. But I want to make sure I'm not buying one that's Korean or Vietnam or a civilian knockoff. So hopefully that gave you enough information. Do your own research as well, you know. Take what I've given you and maybe dig a little deeper and, and maybe you'll find a different tell. But this was what I was able to find through some pretty exhausting research over the last couple of days. Now, my word of warning to all of you, you can see that I have one here on my keychain. Um, I love it on my keychain just because it is... Uh, I just don't want my dad's name out there. Um... I love it on the keychain just because it's that tool that you never know when you're going to need something. You know, a bottle opener, it works well to open a bottle if you need to set. And I've had, you know, root beer, some of that kind of designer root beer you buy where you're like, oh, and then it's not a screw-off cap. So, little uh, bottle opener. Um, the blade works great to open cans. I've been in situations where it's like, holy cow, I didn't realize I needed a can opener to open this can at the campfire. So, it works great to do that and the like. Now, the problem is... Sorry, I got really loud. The problem is that some airports, for whatever reason, in their infinite wisdom, and I shouldn't say airports, some TSA view this as a potential weapon. And the internet is rife with stories of uh, veterans, of campers, of whoever, that have one of these on their keychain or in their pocket or, um, you know, uh, uh, in their wallet or what have you, and the TSA says, nope, it's confiscated. You know, either give it to us or uh, you cannot fly. And what's interesting, it's random. A lot of the accounts, uh, testimonials and that, people had flown all over the country, all over the world, and then it just took one airport where the TSA agent was like, uh-uh-uh, no way is that coming on board the aircraft, okay? Because obviously you can tell that this is a very dangerous weapon compared to something like a key. You know, I mean, I, sometimes their, their, their rationalization is, is very interesting to me. That being said, however, you know, I take with a grain of salt the confiscation stories because my wife, um, when we were flying, forgot that she had her uh, um, Swiss Army knife in her purse. 
And that's a big no-no. I mean, that's a truly big no-no. And she had carried that Swiss Army knife for years and years and years. And, and the agent's like, sorry, I mean, you, you cannot fly with this. And my wife's like, well, what am I going to do? And they were very nice. They're like, well, you know what? Just step out of the line here and we will mail it to you. Just write down all your information, and I don't even know if they charged her. I think they charged her postage, but she filled all of the information, and sure enough, a couple weeks later, her Swiss Army knife showed up at our house in the mail. So if you're caught with one of these, and it's something that, you know, gosh, this was my granddad's or my dad's, and they say, you know, we have to confiscate it, I would ask about having it mailed home. But to make life easy on you, I would recommend that if you are flying, simply pop it off your keychain, leave it at home, or if you really feel you have to have it with you, I... Uh, Pack it in your luggage. So once you get there, you can unpack it and put it back on your keychain. So that is my episode on the mess kit find. And as I said, the reason I bought it wasn't, I mean, it is a beautiful mess kit and it will actually go into my collection and be used. But the main reason was those four World War II P-38s, which I thought more than justified the cost of the mess kit. Plus, it was fantastic to do the research on it. And I enjoy, uh, I, I don't know why I said that, I, I enjoy doing the research, but I encourage, that's the word I'm looking for, I encourage all of you to take that information and next time you're at the flea market, see how many World War II P-38s you can find yourself. So on that note, this is Steve reminding all of you to keep them rolling.